So here's the paper. I like this paper because it actually goes two steps up the food chain instead of just one, makes it a little more interesting. And because it's got a bunch of weird protists in it that I've never heard of. Identification of ciliate grazers of autotrophic bacteria in ammonia oxidizing, accidentated sludge by RNA stabilizotope probing. Done by Mansfield or Mayfield's group. This is, this is the guy who initially uh, made this procedure uh, practical. And so what's his question in this paper? The paper was to identify the grazers that control populations of primary producers in ammonia oxidizing wastewater sludge. In a lot of wastewater sludges, one of the primary things you're trying to do is get rid of ammonia. Nitrogen, right? And there's really a couple of ways you can do this. But one of the primary ones is that you oxidize that ammonia to um, dinitrogen gas, which bubbles off and you don't care about. Or you just let it float off as regular ammonia, which isn't very good. What you don't want to do is, to, is inject that into the wastewater outflow and, and pollute the, the river or whatever it's going. Yeah? Why do you specify We're going to get to that. So the worst thing that can happen in one of these wastewater things is for autotrophic, well, let, let me back up. A lot of the organisms that can do this will incorporate the ammonia directly into biomass. That doesn't help the situation, does it? Because you still got that ammonia in the sample. What you really want them to do is to oxidize it to dinitrogen gas. The organisms that do this are primarily autotrophic. They fix CO2 and oxidize ammonia. They're, they're lithotrophs. So if you're going to do a stable isotope probing experiment, are you going to feed them what they eat? Are you going to feed them labeled ammonium? Doesn't do you any good, right? Because that's just where they get their energy. They're going to oxidize that to dinitrogen gas. Your nitrogen gas is going to be labeled, and you have no information. But when they do this, they fix CO2. So you can label carbonate. You can put the carbonate in, and the organisms in the sample that are autotrophic are the ammonia oxidizers. And so they will take up that CO2, make biomass, and now you've labeled the organisms doing the ammonia oxidation. It's a cute trick. It turns out that in these wastewater systems, the bacteria don't just build up and build up and build up. They do some. But ultimately, protists in there start to feed on them. And this is a positive thing, right? You want them to be eating the organisms, burning them off of CO2, so that the, the carbon in, in the sample doesn't increase. There are a variety of protists that do this. Some of them are ciliates, some of them are amoebas, and so forth and so on. The organism they found was a ciliate, but, but it didn't have to have done. And so you might imagine that if you've got a wastewater sludge with a bunch of bacteria in it, and you've got a bunch of protists in there, that there would be specific protists eating specific bacteria, right? It wouldn't just be that they eat whatever is there. Um, that certainly isn't the way ecosystems work in the macroscopic world, is it? Lions just don't eat anything. They don't eat trees. They don't eat, you know, I don't know elephants very often. There, 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 there are constraints on how they feed. And so their question was, who were the protists that were controlling the populations of ammonia-oxidizing autotrophs? And they're going to do this by stable isotope probing. Their first experiment, they know the chemistry that's going on here. So in order to, to link phenotype and genotype, they have to get the, the phylotypes first, right? They have to know who's there. So they, they did um, standard ribosomal analysis not using bacterial ribosomal primers, but using eukaryotic ribosomal primers to pull out the eukaryotes in the sample. Not enough of that is done, by the way. Every time you do a eukaryotic ribosomal analysis, you pull out a bunch of sequences that you have no idea what they are. There's a bunch of cool biology there. And so they did this, and they found these following organisms. They got tetrahymena. This is basically kind of like paramecium. <laughs> 
um, and so forth. Spumella, zooxanthium, Hartmanella, that's, a, that's a, an amoeba, epistylus, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Some of them, so, so these were fans on a gel, these were clones. Most of the clones were arcella. They also got lots of zooxanthium, lots of chaos, that's another amoeba. This is what these things look like. Zoxanthium is a, is a paratrichus uh, ciliate. There's some flagellates. Here's an amoeba. So this should be familiar to you guys. Here's another amoeba. Tetrahymena, again, it's basically a, a, a paramecium. Vorticella, that's a, that's a pretty creature. And so forth. So these are all, all the protists that they know are in these samples. Well, this is a tricky experiment because you're trying to do a, a stable isotope probing, again, up the food chain. You're going to add uh, a stable isotope labeled carbonate. It's going to be taken up by the autotrophs, and then the protists are going to eat the autotrophs, and then you label the ribosomal RNA you're interested in, right? So you're going two steps up the food chain. And so to get this experiment to work, they're going to verify first that each of the steps are possible. And so the first thing is they want to show that they can they can recover protist RNA from, from these ecosystems. And so they 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 add um, C13 labeled tetrahymena to a sample and then pull out by stable isotope probing the band. How do you use C13 labeled tetrahymena? <clears throat> How do you, so, so you, you're starting by, by adding C13 labeled tetrahymena to this stuff. No, you don't order it. You grow C13 E. coli. You grow E. coli on C13 glucose. You buy glucose. Grow E. coli in it. Spin down the cells, wash them, and feed tetrahymena. Grow tetrahymena on E. coli. E. coli eats bacteria. And then you wash out the E. coli, and what you have less is C13 labeled tetrahymena. You add that to this sludge, and then immediately pull samples out and, and um, run gradients, and you do, do a denaturing gradient gel, and this is the low fraction, the light fraction. Lots of organisms in there. Here's the C13 labeled tetrahymena, and they cut that out and showed that it was the light fraction. So they can prove that they proved that they can go in and detect labeled protist. Can they do that with bacteria? That is, can they follow it up the food chain? So they label E. coli. This is the same E. coli that they made tet the tetrahymena uh, heavy with. They, they made C13 labeled E. coli, put that in the sludge, let it sit for a while, let the protists eat it up, and then see who's in that, see who's labeled. With the, again, with the eukaryotic primers. And sure enough, they get two organisms labeled. Let's see, is that this one? Which one is it? Tetrahymena? Yeah. yeah, and so they, they find these, these bands, and they've got three organisms that they think are eating it, and those are ep Epicarcium, Spumella, and Zooxanthium. Who are those guys? Zooxanthium? This is a filter feeder, right? It beats these flagella and pulls organisms out of solution. Where's spumella? This is the same thing, right? It beats these flagella and picks up bacteria out of the liquid. And the other one was epistylus. Again, one of these paratrichus things. Why would an organism like this eat E. coli, but an organism like this doesn't? Could be. These organisms, the pictures don't show it, but they are all different in size. That's probably not the reason. Uh, the enzymes they're able to produce? The enzymes they're able to produce, maybe. Um, you might imagine that they would have different preference for, you know, they made contact with them. And so if it's, I mean, just as a gross example, if it was gram positive, it might taste different than if it's gram negative, right? But it's simpler than that. E. coli floats around in liquids, right? 
So wouldn't you want something, wouldn't it be more likely that an organism like this that pulls organisms out of the liquid would eat it? And not an organism like this that crawls around on the surface, picking things off the surfaces? So that's a very simple case of feeding selection by these protists. Which ones? Oh, th that's what we're going to find out. So, not only can they pull heavy label protists out and, and detect their presence, but they can add labeled bacteria and determine who's eating them. Now the question becomes, can we put in the initial label label an organism based on the function we're interested in and see that up the food chain. So here's the experiment. They're adding C12 or, C or C13 bicarbonate. C12 is, is, is standard isotope, so this is an unlabeled experiment. This is a control. This is C13. And so these are, these are different, frac different time points, 0, 6, and 10 hours. And these are only the heavy fractions. Now notice there's a lot of stuff in the background here. These experiments, you're pushing the limits of this procedure. And so you're looking for small differences. These, these again, these, these are presumably unlabeled, but this is the amount of material that nevertheless ends up in that part of the gradient. Zero, six, and 10 hours. There's no difference other than loading differences. Zero, six, and 10. And notice that it, Six hours, you get this band that appears when you add C13 carb bicarbonate. And then it goes away, presumably further up the food chain. So this looks real. So you cut it out, right? Who is it? Let's see, high density. They do, they do more than that. Let's see, carbonate. This is, the, this is the definitive experiment here where they're getting a lot more stuff. They've got a series of bands that they believe are labeled up. Oh, so they've added ammonium acetate. In the previous experiment, they're just doing carbonate, so they're looking at, at autotrophy. Here, they spike it in order to get more signal. They spike it also with ammonium. So what's that going to do? You're essentially feeding the ammonia oxidizers, right? They're going to start to grow. They've got lots of energy. They're going to suck up the CO2 and the carb from the carbonate and fix it. And so you're, you're activating the organisms you're most interested in. And then the protists are going to eat them and get labeled. And so when you do that, you end up with a series of bands that um, are labeled Chaos, epistylus, circumonis, etc., and really a, a lot of stuff. So epistylus is the big one. So xanthium is a big one. Epistylus is here. So you can see after six hours. And B. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. This is this is the unlabeled material. This is everything and they've identified all the bands. The other experiment up here, this is epistylus. Right there. This is a complicated experiment. I've got it a little bit muddled in my head. So they think that epistylus is the one eating it. That implies that the ammonia oxidizers are floating around in solution or being picked off by filter feeders. They next do an experiment which I think is a dog. Wouldn't it be nice to try this under denitrifying conditions? The other thing that happens is denitrification in here. And this is when you've got lots of nitrate and, and no oxygen. And you're looking for that nitrate to be oxidized to ultimately nitrogen gas. And so they do the same experiment now, only with acetate, under anaerobic conditions. And so the question is, who, what protists are eating the denitrifying bacteria? 
And so no label, lots of label, different time points, no difference anywhere in the job. And so they cannot detect grazing of denitrifying bacteria in this experiment. What's the flaw? Labeling the acetate. Acetate will very quickly get sucked up in there by somebody. Um, and so you might imagine that lots of organisms will get labeled, but then you would see it in lots of probes, right? But they don't see that. They see no differences between the heavy and light isotopes. They're getting incorporation of this heavy isotope in none of the eukaryotes. Yeah? But you said there's no oxidants, right? These protists are aerobic. Exactly. These are aerobes. In anaerobic conditions, they're not growing, they're not feeding, they're quiet. If they're lucky, dead if they're not. This is one of the limitations of this kind of experiment. Whoops. The other, which I, I mentioned earlier, is that you have to think carefully about what you're using as a probe. You're interested in ammonia oxidizers, but labeling the nitrogen doesn't get you anywhere because they don't incorporate. There's a lot of interest in this kind of experiment for organisms that are co-metabolizers. So for example, um, Mike Hyman here at NC State works on the degradation of MTBE in some leaky underground gasoline storage tanks. MTB is what they used to use before ethanol. That's what you're here to do and it'd be really important because that stuff is soluble in water. It, it goes a long way once the tank starts to leak. It, it also, although it's not very poisonous, it, it really makes the water awful. It smells really bad. Um, wouldn't you like to know who's degraded? Because it does get degraded in the environment. Wouldn't you like to know who does it? The problem is they don't need it. They co-metabolize it. There's an oxygenase that breaks it down, but none of it gets incorporated into the biomass of the cell. And so you can't do the experiment. Um, and there are a lot of kind of co-metabolism takes place. So uh, it breaks it down and then it up. In, in this case, it, it breaks it down and then an organism takes those breakdown products and breaks them down, and those are gases in the flow away. Ultimately CO2. So once again, let's do a quick review. The probe is carbonate. C13 carbonate. You add that to the environment. You're, you also spike it with, um, with nitrate. Because you're interested in the organisms that are oxidizing nitrate or nitrite. In this case, they're nit nitrate oxidizers. And so you spike that in to turn on the metabolism. They, they're autotrophs, they pick up the CO2, they get labeled. So the bacteria carrying out the process you're interested in are labeled. Heavy isotopes. Eukaryotes are feeding on those, and so that heavy isotope label goes to the next step up the food chain. Now, I'm sure you imagine that it would be much easier to detect the bacteria. That's an experiment that they've done previously here. They know who the bacteria are who are doing but then now they're looking at the organisms that eat them, and when they do that, they get a single band, and that organism is epistylus. And epistylus is this one. What practical use could this be, this information? She went, didn't you want to kind of control the formation of the cells and see those bacteria have harmful free to live? Right. So on one hand, you want these autotrophic ammonia oxidizers to be there, right? You want them to blow off that ammonia as, nitri as nitrogen gas. That's a positive thing in this wastewater treatment facility. But on the other hand, you don't want them to grow up and fix a bunch of carbon, and now you've got more carbon in your waste sample that you have to deal with. So what you'd really like 
is for the, the, the ammonia oxidizers to grow at first and then to have them all eaten up. They've already burned off that nitrogen as nitrogen gas. Now you want to burn off their, their carbon as CO2. These things are respirators, so when they eat the bacteria, they burn them up and it comes off as CO2, right? So you can imagine setting up your digesters in such a way that the first part of it facilitates the ammonia oxidation part, and, and you control the epistylus population. And in the next part, you maybe even seed them, right? And, and let, them, let them eat up the ammonia oxidizers. And then you've got less, less carbon and less nitrogen in the field. Uh, you'd be surprised. This kind of stuff actually happens. Um, it, the, the days of just dumping your waste into a cesspool and letting it rot, other than pig farms and chicken farms, are, are long gone. Wastewater treatment is, a, is an important microbiological process, and one that's a lot higher tech than we can even imagine. All right. So that's it for this experiment. Next time, we will talk. It's a really cool experiment. The paper is this one. It's by, from Ed DeLong's lab, where they entirely by accident discover a whole kind of new phototrophy in the ocean water. These are the same guys that did the, um, the SAR-11 stuff. Um, so not only did they discover a, a, you know, how to grow the most abundant organism in the world, but they also discovered that photo, phototrophy in the ocean was a lot more common than, than we thought it was by this really cool system. Mm -hmm.